Hello, uh, Mark. Welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. How are you doing tonight, man? Hey, Sean. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for being on. You have a, a great new book out. Well, not too new, but it's been out for a little while. So I thought we could talk about your start and some of your stories and uh, help promote the book. So people go out and buy this, this, this awesome book, man. Yeah, well, it's. I guess you could say it's like a Cinderella story. You know, <laughs> here's this kid that's 12 years old that <clears throat> never really did good in school and always was worried about like what he was going to do when he grew up. Because that's really, when I was a young kid, I was like, you know, what am I going to do? It's like, I couldn't really, I wasn't really that great at academics and I kind of got by, but I didn't yeah. have passion for anything. I knew I was going to be a rocket scientist or anything like that, or even close, you know? So, <clears throat> so I used to mow lawns for uh, five bucks a, a cut. And as a 12 year old, you know, just to get some money so you can buy an album. So I did that for a season uh, when I was 12 and, and this guy said, uh, I knocked on this one guy's lawn, this guy's house, whose lawn was really high. And I said, do you need your lawn mode? And he's like, no, I do it myself. And uh, he said, that's what he said. And I said, well, it doesn't look that way. And <laughs> he kind of snickered and came back and he says, I'll tell you what, if you mow my lawn for the season, I'll give you this camera. And he just showed me the camera and I was like, all right, I figured I, maybe I can hawk it, you know, for a yeah. you know, hundred bucks. And so, you know, I cut, cut his, his lawn for the season and he gave me this camera and then I just started taking pictures of my, my brother and my dog and, you know, just, you know, I kind of got excited about taking photographs and, and I developed pictures and I got into developing and it was kind of fun for about a year. And then I kind of got bored and I put it on my shelf as uh, you know, it's just kind of like got dust yeah. on it. <clears throat> and then I, my brother started taking me to concerts when I was like 14. And I started sneaking my camera in just for fun. How the hell did you get it in? I remember back then, it still wasn't that easy. I mean, to get stuff in. Yeah, I used to, I used to like break apart the lens and put one down my fry boot, the other one, I uh, put film down the other boot. And then I take okay. the body of the camera, I throw it up, you know, get, you know, under my sweatshirt. You know, and I have some neck jewelry and stuff, so you couldn't see the strap. Can't see it. And then when they pat you down, they go like that. They don't go on your back. So I kind of got the camera in. Then the lights. That's quite slick. Yeah. Then the that's lights go cool. out. You jump over the barricade, and then you get real close. And I kind of dismantle the seats, and then find a nice little niche there that I can shoot. Yeah, I was trying out. to figure that out too. How you dismantle the seats like that? That's a pretty cool idea that you uh, mm -hmm. totally MacGyver that thing. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that was good because then you have your own spot for the whole night. You know, the no the usher can't come down and. And mess with you so it was fun and i did that and then i used to sell my pictures in front of uh con you know the next day when they would play a second night mm -hmm. i would sell them in front of my high school locker and you know and you know just fun doing uh until i got arrested at a kiss concert in 77 <laughs> and i went in a paddy wagon overnight and i was like all right now what <clears throat> and so i was reading my circus magazine i looked in the masthead to find out where the address was and it said new york you know it's got on the same train Went to the office, didn't know anyone, just went in there. And it was just good timing. And I met the art director and the publisher, Jerry Rothberg. And they told me to shoot different film and do this and do that. Gave me some tips. I was only 17 years old. And, uh, and then I came back in the summer. I had some pictures of Aerosmith. I just dropped, I dropped off. Uh, I told them I had some good pictures of Aerosmith and they needed them. I left him there and two months later it was in the centerfold of Steven Tyler and a full page of Ted Nugent and, and the ball started rolling from there. So but when you did it, you were taking different pictures and with the lighting, it was different, I imagine. Black and white color, the cost, and then like just the lighting in the concert from where you're located with lenses. Was that kind of a, a challenge no, for you? It's, no, it's just that kind of it was trial and error. You know, you just, yeah. you just kind of get used to it. And, you know, the lighting was pretty good and, uh, you know, it just, you, you, it's not like you, digital where you see it right away. So it's like you never knew until you, you got home and developed the pictures if you had right. it. Um, I mean, I, I tried it. It's horrible before I did digital. Now, even then, you know, it's not the same. So your pictures are fantastic. I'm like, how did he figure out with yeah. basic gear and a dark yeah. auditorium, yeah. you know? No, it, it, was a lot, it was a lot of stress. It was a lot of stress for sure. Like I had a lot of, always had, until I saw the pictures, and then the black and white you used to put them in this little tank and used to like roll it in and you have to get yep. it right or it get if they rub against each other it will you'll screw up the image so that happened a couple of times and it's like oh my god you know you, you get, start getting to some magazines start to break free at that point 
So Kiss, so it's between Kiss and Aerosmith, your two big ones. But along the same time, I don't know the timeline, actually a little further on now because you've been taking some pictures of some people. You also introduced a few people like Zach mm -hmm. and um, Sebastian Bach. Yeah. Did you connect them first through pictures and then say, yeah. like affiliate to the other bands type of deal? Or Well, with Sebastian is I, sh I shot this band called Madam X in 1986. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then they hired me, or they hired me to fly to Phoenix and shoot. And then I got married like maybe six months later and I had my secretary invite, you know, invite the band, you know, I just met him, we hung out, you know, and we just started chatting and next thing you know it, he's on stage with Kevin Dubrow and Zach Wilde. And uh, my best man at my, at my wedding was friends with Snake and he kind of put two and two together and just kind of linked them all up. And that's how Sebastian got into Skid Row through my friend oh, Dave. Wow. And Zach, big... Zach was already in Ozzy, he didn't record yet, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, you know, I've been working with Ozzy since '81, and the night before, I was with Sharon and Ozzy looking at guitar players. And I remember the last thing I said is like, "I'll keep my eyes open," because the the guy that we were looking at in Long Island definitely wasn't the person. And then right, that, right. that next day, me, my friend Dave, the same guy, uh, he went to this club called uh, Close Encounters. Uh, I stayed home, and uh, he told me he saw this guy. He was incredible. He's in a band called Cyrus. And uh, I he brought, brought it to my studio. I was going to introduce him to Ozzy. I ended up getting a tape to Ozzy, and they flew him out for an audition, and he got the gig. So yeah, it was fun. That wedding was definitely, you know, so Sebastian and Zach is before they had any recordings with any of these bands that would soon be a household name. Actually, isn't that clip up on YouTube? Yeah, I actually, <clears throat> on, uh, on my... I started getting involved with this exhibition at this, the Monmouth Museum in Lincroft, New Jersey. And at the end of it, that Halloween time, I had a um, thing called uh, Welcome to My Exhibition. I dressed up like Alice Cooper. I even sang Welcome to My Nightmare. And I had <laughs> my good friend Keith Roth from Sirius Radio uh, and his band of ghouls. We had Rob Afuso. We had uh, uh, Jerry Gaskell on drums too. And uh, Mark from Accept, he sang a couple songs. So we had this whole program and I would interview people virtually and show them around the museum in different areas. <clears throat> so um, we did showcase the one with Kevin Dubrow. It, was, it, it would have been Kevin's 65th birthday on, uh, on uh, how, I think his birthday is like the 30th or the 29th. And so we were kind of like celebrating his, his, what would have been a 65th. And uh, announcing uh, a book that I'm self-publishing uh, called Keep On Rolling. And it's like pretty much Kevin Dubrow's story. And this girl, Missy, who was the fan club president at the, um, the Dubrow, and then later was the fan club president for Quiet Riot during the mental health yeah. uh, record. So I you know, met her and we kind of like launched it on this uh, Indiegogo. We're more than halfway there now. It's another few weeks. So I encourage people to go down and, and try to you know, pre-order the book. And there's little bundles and pictures and things you can get. And it's pretty much Kevin's story uh, through the Randy Rhodes years, through a photographer, mm -hmm. Ron Sobel, who did all the early stuff. And then I came into the picture in 83 uh, when mental health came out. So it has my photos from, from that period oh, and all of uh, Missy's snapshots from, you know, the late seventies to the eighties and uh, little notes from Kevin and oh, fan wow. club things. And, you know, it's, it's a good That's book. Awesome. It's uh, you know, it's, uh, and Rudy Sarza is doing the forward. So uh, we celebrated at the, at the, at the Halloween. Cause like I said, he would have been the 65 years old. Uh, so yeah, we'll put the link up underneath the show. So yeah, can check yeah. It out. So I, on my, I have a YouTube channel called The Decade That Rocked. It's on my yep. website too. The Decade That Rocked. Everything's the Decade That Rocked. Give and, me an email. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, those two clips that were on, I think Rolling Stone debuted the Led Zeppelin one with they, they did rock and roll, mm -hmm. and, and Guitar World uh, debuted uh, the Bang Your Head one. Uh, is like I said, 1987, you know, skinny yeah. kids, long hair, a lot of hair. And uh, yeah, it's fun. So go, I would say go over there, check that out. And then while you're there, you can get a book too. I have t-shirts, I have postcards, yeah, a whole bunch of good stuff.
little, I think um, little... you did some work with Bon Jovi and there's two different stories I read in the book that we can do. The first one is the slippery story. And the second one is the, uh, the big cowboy shoot you guys did at the end. Right, right. Well, it was first supposed to be called, the Bon Jovi album was, was originally called Wanted Dead or Alive. So they all came into my studio, they grew beards. They came in one at a time, they had the hats on, you know, like they were in Billy, Billy the Kid movie. <clears throat> I pieced it together to make a Wanted poster and, and that was mm -hmm. supposed to be the cover. Then they said they didn't want him to be scruffy. So then I went to Vancouver. We shot it out in Vancouver in a, in a warehouse that kind of looked like an old abandoned kind of hideaway. And they were clean shaven and a little bit more rock and roll clothes. And then we had the, uh, the, the wanted poster in the background of it. So that was the okay. tie in. Yeah. So that was wanted. And then they decided to change the name uh inspired by the number five club in vancouver and uh it's a strip club and girls used to go in this plexiglass cage and you know wet them down and uh we would all have drinks and be drooling all over them and of course uh so we would that's that's where that album cover came from uh kind of slippery and wet and then i think doc mcgee the manager came up with the name slippery and wet because of the road sign so we kind of put two and two together and uh -huh. that image and then, so the plan was when we went back to jersey that we would shoot it in, down by the jersey shore get a bunch of cars get some girls and get some t-shirts that says slippery when wet cut them up a little bit and that's what we did um which i think ended up being the inner sleeve um yeah. and then one of the girls that we found on the beach had is angela is the girl with a really big breast that we put front and center yeah. and we asked her if she wanted to come in and be on the cover. So that was the plan B is to put her on the cover and the back cover would be them washing the cars and washing the girls and the whole mm -hmm. thing uh, down the Jersey shore. Uh, it was the PMRC was going on when they were putting labels on, on a lot of the albums that were yeah. a little sexually, you know, con you know, the content was a little, you know, sexual uh, mm -hmm. and they, they didn't want to take any chances and Walmart and some of the big chains pulling that, that record. <clears throat> and uh, so then we had to come up with something else. And then in the final hour, John came over to my studio. He said, Mark, I I'm coming over. I have an idea. Just have a black plastic bag and, and a spray bottle to wet it down. And I just set it up. He came over, I sprayed the water bottle and he wrote slippery when wet. And he said, that's it. I said, you know, do you want to see the, the Polaroids or anything because no just take a picture and send it to the record company and that was it that's, so. that's crazy it feels like it's just like this is what they're gonna get I'm just gonna this is, this is what they want this is what they get it didn't hurt the album though the album did pretty well well yeah it, it, John's philosophy and you know ended up being everyone's was you know you know don't tell them that you know girls sell don't tell them that their faces sell you know let, let, let the music speak for itself probably it better because there was nobody, there's no one looking at the album being offended by it. It was just the album, you know, it didn't kind of exactly. alienate yeah. anybody, you know? Yeah. You know, it was. Well, it, did, it didn't album. hurt the ACDC Black album, did it? Or Metallica? No, no, <laughs> right? Or Spinal Tap. Yeah. <laughs> the Black album. So I'm going to, I'm going to go over a couple names of uh, some artists you worked with. If you have any stories of, uh, and share with them. How about like, Alice Cooper? He seems like he's been a really, really fun guy to work with. <laughs> Yeah, I remember shooting Alice in the mid 80s, you know, big fan, you know, there's a picture in 77. I was 17 when I took my first picture of him, NASA Coliseum with the guillotine. Mm -hmm. It's a full page. Uh, yeah. And uh, I remember when I first met him, it was a trip because, I mean, Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper. Uh, not So this is the mid 80s and and he was he had like um, a lot of stage you know, stage gimmicks and stuff. And we mm -hmm. kind of took a lot of things underneath uh, the stage and we set some up, props up and things like that. But it was really cool. <clears throat> but then I remember like telling him, I said, all right, come on, Alice, give me something with your hands. And he's like, Mark, I ain't that kind of guy, you know, because I used to tell the, the you know, the, like Dee Snyder and, you know, Brett Michaels, I always like yeah. have be animated with their hands. <clears throat> Alice took a little offense to it. And he's like, Mark, I don't, I'm not that kind of guy. He goes, I'm not one of those guys, you know, just, you know, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you Alice. And I said, okay, no problem. So, uh, but we have, have a good relationship 
still to today. And and I dressed up like Alice and even sang Welcome to My Nightmare on my uh, exhibition, which I have little clips on my YouTube channel, which is pretty funny. It's pretty good, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I love the Alice pictures. I remember going through the book, it's like, I remember this. I remember this magazine. I remember it's like literally just, you know, going through it. A side note though, so like when you work with people, are you kind of almost like a psychologist or, or that, you know, when you work with people, do you kind of like have to blend with them a little bit? Yeah, I kind of, I try to let them, I mean, I try to get what I can get. And then I, I try to, you know, feel them out to see if they're up for ideas. And, you know, obviously if it's an album cover and it's a collaborative effort that I'm a little more aggressive uh, with my ideas. But if it's something just, you know, a lot of times I would just do a shoot before they go on stage and I would just get them to change their outfits and just get as much as I can because there were so many magazines back then. <clears throat> but, you know, you got to feel them out. Uh, a lot of times I, I really like doing photographs right before they go on stage. You hear the crowds going and it's like there's 10 minutes before showtime. Last thing they want to do is do a photo shoot, but that's the, that's the best time because it's like the energy. they're not thinking about it. They just want to just, uh, so I get them for, even if it's like two minutes before they go on stage, it's just a certain, certain kind of energy you get at that point as opposed to like a five or 10 hour photo shoot, you know, where they're just kind of, you know, so it's, you get, you get some good, good moments there. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really just got to feel them out. The more you shoot them, the more comfortable they are. And you show them the photos in the magazine, they get happy. They like what you did. You know, it's all about editing. You, you want to edit the best shots, leave them in, take out the bad ones and just get along. And I was just, you know, I just always got along with every, all those guys. Cause we all like, we pretty much like the same music. You know, we all, you know, we all grew up on, you know, Kiss, Aerosmith, Zeppelin, uh, you know, most of those bands. And so we're cut from the same cloth and, you know, we're all into the sex, drugs and rock and roll back then. So that always, that worked too. And it was just fun times. I imagine that obviously the newer bands were just so excited to have a photographer, like the first time professional, and then the guys, like you said, you've worked with, you got relationships, they've seen you do the work, they know they can trust you. I would think that the more challenging wouldn't have been like, you know, they've been in the business for a while, they haven't dealt with you, they've already kind of gone the road. It's not as exciting having a photographer coming in. So you're new, but they've been experienced for a while. You got to kind of come in and kind of prove yourself. I think that's what I always imagine would have been the hardest part for you. Well, the one experience <laughs> that wasn't that great, in which I talk about it openly in my book, is my Danzig story. Yes, I was going to ask you about that at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. this is a, this is a situation where the record company hired me. They, they saw all the album covers they did. They hired me to like my work and they hired me to shoot Danzig. I never shot him. I never met him. Uh, they came to my studio for the first time, like a lot of the bands did. And mm -hmm. I just treat everyone the same way. And I pose them around and they were just very, um, they didn't, they didn't move, you know, and I, I, they didn't move. I said, turn to the left. A little, I'm trying to get their angles right. So I really mm -hmm. couldn't get, get, I couldn't do what I, they, they, you know, the record company wanted me to do is make them look good. So I just started, I went, what I usually do when this happens is I go over and I start moving them. Like, <laughs> like yeah, I usually do it kidding around, you know? Uh, but when I did it to their, to them, the first guy like kind of went with it. I forget his name. When I got to Glenn and I was ready to touch Glenn, He's like, don't touch me. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I took a few more pictures and I was like, all right, we're done. Uh, they ended up using it for the inner sleeve for the, or the gatefold for that first uh, debut album for dancing. So it's they, crazy because, yeah, but you were doing it. Like, weren't you trying to adjust the angles for to, to make it look like, you know, Glenn was you know, more monstrous, more intimidating because yeah, he's the yeah. shortest member of the band and it's a complimentary shot that you were doing. You weren't, you know, he's only going to look good in it. I know, but he didn't. I guess, yeah, I don't know, I know. I, you know, it's just, I'm trying to get some different things. When they don't move, it's like, you get the same shot. You want to try an experiment and they really weren't listening. So I went in there and started moving them and, and I always kid around, you know, but they didn't, they didn't laugh. And <laughs> Doesn't surprise I found out years later, it's like, I remember going to one of the shows and they scratched my name off the photo pass list, you know, and I found out that, you know, Glenn didn't take a liking to me and, that's why. So that's was, a shame. Yeah, I yeah, I, 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 the first person I, I bumped into him. I think 
maybe 10 or 15 years ago and I either forgot or didn't know it was me, but you know, we hung out a little bit and, you know, said hi. Well, that's good. I mean, I love his music, but I, yeah, yeah, that's not the first story that's been out there <laughs> about yeah. that. How about um, Guns N' Roses? Now you, you got some of them early on too. Yeah, I shot them right after I shot Sebastian in Phoenix. I had the management fly me to LA to shoot some bands and there was a new band called Guns N' Roses. Bryn Bryanthal was the publicist who, who was the publicist for Motley Crue out of her Electra. And mm -hmm. now she's working at Geffen. And I called her, I said, I'm going to be in town. You know, can you, you have anything going on? And she said, I have this new band called Guns N' Roses that, uh, you know, I'll set you up a photo, you know, session with if, uh, see if they want to do it. And they were a little reluctant because they had their own photographer at the time. And didn't really want to bring anyone from the outside, but Bryn luckily talked him into, you know, shooting with me. And that was my first shoot. Uh, uh, and if you look at it, you look at the shot of Sebastian and you look at the shot of Axel and it's like the same background. It's just a different color gel on it. <laughs> uh, and it was only within like two weeks apart from each other. And both their hair was like, so like huge. Is that? Yes. Yeah, huge. Uh, and then, um, then they came around to New York and I shot them again. They liked me. Uh, I did a photo shoot at my studio. They did the CBGB show and the Ritz. So they, they gave me access. They liked me and I got them in the magazines and we had a good relationship. I, I, I think the great thing is you got a couple of shots with the hair because pretty quickly he lost the hair. Once they started hitting big, mm. he lost the hairspray. He went down fast. So you got one of the few shots of the, yeah. of the big hair. Yeah. You know, that, that's the Before the album even came out. Yeah. And then I would say that once it came out, it was like flat hair, down long, shoulder length. That was yeah, and everyone followed that trend. Yeah. Well, it was a big trend. <laughs> um, Aerosmith, so you had a good relationship with Joe Perry, though, beyond the regular band when they kind of did, they went separate. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, actually, when they, that's when I developed my relationship with both Aerosmith and Joe Perry. Mm -hmm. Uh, when Crespo got in the band for Aerosmith, uh, Lieber Krebs was still managing them and I was working with Lieber Krebs and I was shooting their shows and they were only playing like big clubs at that point. Yeah. There, it was their dark days and, uh, and I got to know Stephen well, you know, we hung out a lot uh, with the band. Uh, and then Joe was doing a solo project, the Joe Perry project, and he mm -hmm. was playing really small clubs, like 100 people. and. And I've always loved Joe and I was, you know, I went to this show in New Jersey, small club and, you know, introduced myself, uh, showed him some pictures that I shot that were at circus and we kind of clicked and I was shooting for We Magazine. I was shooting naked, naked girls, like half naked girls with rock stars and what a concept, right? right. Uh, and I did Ozzy, Motley, I uh, did a couple Motorhead. And I asked Joe if he wanted to do it. It's a national a national magazine's penthouse, uh, not penthouse, um, uh, Wii magazine, which was owned by Playboy. Uh, and I asked him if he would, you know, pose with uh, with a hot blonde, which was my girlfriend at the time. And we got a motorcycle and some cars, and he came over to my house in New Jersey and spent the day there doing that. And you know, we got he got we got a lot of attention. And uh, I know later Ronnie told me he kind of thanked me because that was like the that was like the the nail that sealed the coffin on his marriage because uh, I don't think his wife liked that. But he ended Is that up. Is that the picture in the book? Is that the picture in the book? <laughs> yeah, laying across that one. Yeah, yeah, that was my yeah. girlfriend. And, oh, really? And his uh, his wife didn't really like it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but then Joe met Billy and. You know he's still happily married and all yeah, that. Yeah, it's legendary. There, there's, there's a bunch of a couple as Stephen and him are a couple. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's awesome. You um had a good relationship with Dokken, huh? Yeah, Dokken. I yeah, Dokken was uh, one of my buds. Uh, again, it was Electra. So Bryn Bienthal hired me to do the publicity photos. This is when George had like the the white hair, kind of yeah, like the fashion uh, Google, like a, you know. And, yeah. Uh, but that's the first photo shoot. It was uh, tooth and nail publicity photos. Mm -hmm. Came friends right away. Nice bunch of guys like the party, hang out. And uh, uh, then the next album came under lock and key and they asked me to do the cover and I art directed it. And, you know, they, 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 they did regret that photo shoot because of uh, the clothes the and everything. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's the sign, it was a sign of the times. Like they didn't even know that 
those outfits were going to be so outrageous until the photo shoot and it was too late to do anything. So we spent all this money on the set and the studio and the clothes and, uh, and they all put on their, their outfits. They could barely move. Yep. You know, there was like, you know, red, green, purple, and yellow or so I don't even know, but uh, I'll be honest with you. The album was, first of all, the album was so good. Yeah. It's all forgiven for that album to begin with, but, but I never really looked that close to the pictures. I saw that they called outfits. It was kind of like the time of the day. Until already they started complaining about it, and I saw the big picture that blew up. I'm like, man, it looks like Robin Hood. I mean, I didn't ever really even focused on the on what they were wearing. I just saw the colors, and that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's those, definitely, those are definitely popped out, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, every time I see them, they always kind of like they they won't want me talking about it. But you know, look, we're still talking about it. If it was just a picture of them in jeans or something, or something else uh it wouldn't give them something to talk about but we're it, talking about them because it's affiliated with a great album that he did in a great you know discography i mean it's not just it's it's a, a you know, it's a benchmark you know exactly yeah it didn't hurt it, it, let's put it this way it didn't hurt the, the record sales that's for sure no no it didn't i guess i didn't even notice how close the, they were it's pretty funny well it's interesting because you were friends with kevin a lot of a lot of singers are known for being kind of outrageous or not get along and maybe it was other other artists because competition or whatever it was but a lot of guys are kind of known to be kind of prickly and maybe not really like that, but you were friends with all of them, which is kind of a, yeah, I used to, a telling thing. Don and Kevin both gave me keys to their house when they were on the road or even when they were home, you know? And I, I still love Kevin, hanging out with Kevin. And whenever I remember going to the Rainbow and say, hey, where are you staying, Weiss? And I'm like, I'm staying in Kevin's house. He goes, Kevin? I said, yeah, Kevin Dubrow. He goes, oh my God, you're staying at Kevin's house? I'm like, yeah, what's up with that? He's like, you tell him to like, you know, keep his mouth shut, you know, because, you know, he was a squeaky wheel, you know, he, that he, was the problem. Uh, that's just what he, that was his, in his DNA to, to be like that, you know. He seemed like he was the nicest guy in the world, but then he would always say something outrageous and you want to be like, Kevin, come on, just keep it down. You're like the best guy. Just kind of keep that to yourself, you know. He couldn't, he couldn't, you know, and, uh, oh, you know, know. <laughs> it is, you know. we, one of the, uh, the covers of the magazine, we actually tied him up with him, we gagged him and you know, with a gag in his yeah. mouth. So he, he embraced it, you know, he definitely didn't, it's not like he, he like lost his cool or anything. He, you know, he embraced his personality and uh, the rock bands, you know, his friends didn't like it or his, you know, his contemporaries. Yeah. He had a good voice though. I don't know what the fans thought. I mean, the fans always liked their good little, uh, good friction. So it, it, it might have helped sell records, to be honest with you. I mean, look, they were number one album. It went great. Yeah. I was, I was just kind of bummed out to hear bands fight, though, like a little bit. You know what I mean? Like you hear a band, you know, George and, you know, Donner fighting or like, yeah, Kevin saying bad things with other bands all the time. You're like, come on, man. It kind of takes the polish off. You're like, just do your music, you know? I think yeah. that's for my prerogative. You know, a lot of, a lot of people are like that at some level. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'd rather them be buddies than anything else, but he just couldn't help himself. <laughs> they were funny though he did have some he was the one that really kind of lit it up though back in the day yeah that's awesome so i actually just wanted um you worked with um obviously ozzy you got a couple of ozzy stories to kind of oh. share last, yeah. last of my questions on the band yeah. I just wanna... well there's the the in the book i have three gatefolds i have a van halen mm -hmm. i have um guns and roses and i have an ozzy one now the Ozzy one, you open it up and it's Ozzy in the, in the bunny outfit. So I tell the story in the book and it was pretty funny. I remember Sharon coming over. We were doing a, we were doing a photo shoot for Faces magazine cover called, and we were kind of playing off of Dire of a Madman and it was the mm -hmm. Mother's Day issue. So we dressed him up like a mad housewife, you know, <laughs> colors in it, just totally crazy, you know, because Ozzy let me do crazy stuff and we had fun doing it. And when we got into the studio, I mean, he was prepared to do that. And that would have been good enough, really. Uh, but then when we walked in, I shared my space with, uh, with another photographer, a commercial photographer. And in the corner of the, of the uh, studio was uh, flowers and a trestle and a bunny outfit. And it was Easter time. So I guess the still life photographer is doing kind of Easter, Easter theme, you know? Yeah. And, and Ozzy says, what's that over there, Mark? And I looked over for the first time, I noticed this bunny outfit. I said, well, that's your bunny outfit. You're gonna, we're gonna wear that. <laughs> He's like, what? And, and then Sharon looked at me, he says, all right, boys, I'm gonna go shopping, I'll see you later. And 
That was the first time I heard Ozzy like yell Sharon, you know. <laughs> and then and then I said, "Come on, Ozzy." He goes and he's like, "Oh, all right, all right." And he he put it on. I couldn't believe he put it on. And then uh, maybe 15 years go by, and I never released them because I could you release pictures. I didn't even show it to them for approval because I thought it was just ridiculous, you know. <laughs> it's a darkness in a Easter Bunny outfit. This is like. 84 when he was the real yeah. it's a darkness he wasn't doing too many he was doing crazy stuff but that was not even crazy it was just silly so i sent the picture on easter to sharon and ozzy and uh <laughs> next thing you know it, it's all over the social media like i didn't know that they were going to post it you know it's like it was it's been in the in the in the bunny closet for like you know 15 years and it's like that's awesome you know and then when she posted it then i posted it and every year they post it and i post it and i tell the story in the in the, in the you, book so you that. you probably got him doing a lot of the sillier stuff because i remember like there wasn't a lot of crazy stuff in the magazines back then you know and i read them all but mm -hmm. the aussie ones you know the pictures over the years they kind of get, get he was the most different one in all of them you know in the costume with a housewife or you're like everyone's yeah. serious and then he's in a, he's in a dress yeah, the pink tutu and the boxing yeah. gloves, and yeah, it was it was a good sport. It's it called the Mama Museum, and I did this exhibition, like I talked okay. about earlier, and uh, I got to meet the board, and they liked my vision. <clears throat> they got a grant, and I have some ways to raise some money too through my photography and charity buzz auctions, and raise raise awareness, which I did a lot of raising awareness to the to the museum. Uh, mm -hmm. So I. I asked if they would consider doing some kind of a musical experience uh, in this one wing that they were rebuilding and they, mm -hmm. they liked the idea and uh, that's what we're going to do. So and hopefully by March when it opens up again, we'll have something in place and I'm going to be spearheading it with uh, the other board members and try to get some involvement with uh, local, not local, but you know, musicians that were, were from Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, I just did this uh, holiday extravaganza, which I hosted when they kind of like formally introduced me as the newest board member. And I did a whole little shtick where we took them around to the different areas. Yeah. And it was very, it was a holiday friendly thing. We've got some local artists that were not local, but tri-state, mm -hmm. uh, Bob Berger and my friend Keith Roth, who's on Sirius Radio with Zusu from Soraya and uh, this girl, Christine and just a, a bunch of people that we got together and we played holiday music and in between we showed around the museum. Yeah. Uh, There's an hour and you, you can see that too. It's called uh, the Mount Museum and you can check it out on my Facebook and there's a, I think it's going to be up. It's free. Uh, it's a free link. It's going to be up until probably another week or two. Um, so yeah, it's fun. Little Steven's on it. He's talking about his teach rock program uh the rocket kids the foundation that i'm involved in that's over mm -hmm. by brookdale college if you're from jersey you'll know brookdale and lincroft so it's just uh you know it's just spreading the musical experiences in another part of the museum that's not uh uh related to you know uh art and photographs so it's is it gonna be static or is it gonna be a moving thing is it gonna change after a while or uh, I'm sure we're going to change some things around, but, uh, I have some ideas to, uh, you know, to have like a, maybe like a Bon Jovi experience, uh, an E street band experience yep. and create some artifacts that were maybe, you know, something from my photo shoots and bring it there where you can pose in front of it, where it looks like it was the photo in the album cover or something like that. And <clears throat> doing a, uh, a I think people like that a lot. Yeah. Doing a thing called banding together where, you know, all different age groups come by and, you know, we try to hook them up with other band members. Cause right now, especially it's really hard to, yeah. for everyone to connect. I mean, they do it virtually, but there's nothing like really having, you know, four people, <clears throat> you know, in a band in one room. Mm -hmm. So I think once the COVID uh, cleans up and, and uh, we can have a program like that, I think it's going to be really successful. You know, it's a good meeting place. It's very, it's a big, it's a big place. So it's uh, uh, when it was open, they, they just closed in January, but because of COVID. Uh, but when it was open, you know, they were very, like, they cleaned it, washed it down and everything. But we're going to do some renovating now, and we should be open in March and uh, hopefully have a, a nice new experience there. Uh, and March comes in, you know, hopefully if I'm in town every March, I mean, every Friday or Thursday, yeah. we'll come up with a date. 
you come in, say hi, and I'll sign books so you can buy photos and look around, have a whole musical experience. That sounds awesome. All right, well, I'll probably link. So everything that you talked about is the end of the thing. And um, I want to thank you, man. It's been a really All great right. to give you some time tonight, man. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll talk Appreciate to you it. soon. All right. All right, bye.